Okay, we'll go ahead and begin. Welcome to the I4 Energy seminar series. A special welcome to those who are joining us on other campuses at UC Merced, uh, Davis, and Santa Cruz. And just note that next week we will not have a, a seminar to, due to the, uh, the spring break, as well as a holiday here. So I have the honor of, of introducing our speaker today, Professor Spanos. Costa Spanos has, has degrees from National Technical University in Athens, Georgia, as well as an MS and PhD Excuse in me, e Athens, Greece. I'm sorry, what did I say? I You're Athens, right, Georgia. I said Athens, Georgia. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I knew that, and he I knows that. Explain my accent. <laughs> <laughs> Athens, Greece, and it even says it right here, so I apologize for that. Athens, Greece, of course, uh, and MS and PhD um, at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, he's been at here at UC Berkeley in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science since 1988. Uh, he has served as director of the Berkeley Microlab, associate dean for research, and as the department chair. He has contributed to two successful startup companies. He's presently the director of the Center for Research and Energy Systems Transformation, CREST, and of the Berkeley Educational Alliance for Research in Singapore, BEARS. Great. So please join me in welcoming Professor Spanos. Thank you. Okay, it's a great honor to be here. And uh, today I would like to tell you about uh, the project that we have uh, in Singapore. Actually, it's, it's a partnership between Singapore and Berkeley on smart buildings. In fact, uh, sustainable tropical buildings. And the first thing I would like to start that is the, the, I would like to describe a little bit of the business model of this collaboration because it's quite interesting. It is a partnership between UC Berkeley, Nanyang Technological University, the National, National University of Singapore, and Singapore's National Research Foundation. And uh, so this is roughly equivalent to RNSF. So through this partnership, we made this possible, and I will explain how it works. Just a little bit about the business model. Uh, what uh, NRF has done has brought together several big name international universities. We are one of 10. I don't have all 10 of them in here in the list. And uh, the idea is to bring us into Singapore, collaborate with the local universities, uh, give us the resources to attack big problems at large scale. So these are multi $10 million programs that we can do. And we are in very good company, as you see there. But the interesting thing is that they have built a campus. They have built a physical campus called the CREATE campus. CREATE is a complicated acronym here, which I'm not going to try to remember. We're given an entire floor of a nice high-rise building. This is the smart buildings floor that belongs to us. It is conveniently one flight down from NRF, so they can keep a close eye to, to, to us. And it recently has won an award for laboratory design. This is not, by the way, a computer generation. It's the actual university town. Uh, Singapore is not always as sunny as you see it here. Uh, this is the high-rise building. We have the 11th floor to ourselves. Uh, this building sprang out of the ground just uh, you know, less than two years ago, and you can see it's all uh, you know, engulfed in greenery. So we have this high rise that has primarily offices and dry laboratories. So our dry lab occupies that side of the building. And we have three uh, buildings, three, three bar buildings that are equipped for wet laboratories. And here we have some presence through the work that we have on materials and also, of course, collaboration with other universities. So 10, 10, 10 international universities collaborating with the locals in one physical space. which is kind of makes it quite interesting. But uh, let's go away from the sunny uh, reality in Singapore. Uh, this is the problem, and so I'm not going to elaborate too much. It's all about sustainability. And our part of the problem is buildings. Buildings is a big part of the problem. Right? You heard the statistics before. Half of the world's energy, this is very easy number to remember, is being spent inside both residential and uh, commercial buildings. Three quarters of world's electricity is being spent in there. Uh, all of us acknowledge that it's not being spent well. There are obvious inefficiencies every time you look. And uh, unfortunately, there are no low-hanging fruit because the reality is very complex. This is the US reality in residential buildings and in commercial buildings. There are low, lots of fruits, not, of the, or not all of them low-hanging. You might think that heating will be important, and of course it is important, but if you look at what contributes to heating inefficiencies and heating spending, it is a really complex problem. Uh, it depends on geography, it depends on climate, it depends on economics, and so on. Now, we are focusing on the tropics. 
Uh, the simple answer as to why tropics is because Singapore is in the tropics and they gave us lots of money. However, uh, the reality is that, uh, that this happens to be a very big market. Uh, about, uh, if you look at uh, the, geog not the geographic de description of the tropics, the geographic description is anything between those two lines as you can see the tropics. But if you look at the climate description of the tropics, where all 12 months have a mean temperatures above 18 degrees Celsius or 64 degrees Fahrenheit, you can see these areas here, these colored areas here, and of course this is much more intense than those. But, but the most interesting part is that uh, I didn't realize that 40% of the world's population today lives in these areas. And in 50 years, it's going to be 60%. Now, it's going to be 60% because of a combination of two things. One thing is global warming. Global warming, in fact, has moved the geographical definition, the, the climatic de definition of the tropics by quite a bit. But primarily, it is a demographic. It is urban migration to megacities and so on that concentrates the population there. And there is another element, I don't have a nice picture for it, that uh, buildings in the tropics in the future, they're going to look like Singapore looks today, meaning very concentrated high rises, both for residential and commercial. OK, what is Simber Best? This is a program that I would like to describe today. Simber Best starts from Singapore, Berkeley, a building efficiency and sustainability in the tropics. And it is, a, it is a fairly comprehensive program. It's a very large program. We receive about 45 million over five years. That gives us the opportunity to do it, to do it at scale. Uh, we're looking at uh, this comprehensive optimization with uh, three important entities, the occupants, the building, and the grid. And of course, you would like to minimize energy consumption, but it is not as simple as minimizing energy. It is, at best, a constrained optimization, a constrained minimization, because you would like to, to, pre to preserve productivity, you would like to preserve safety, comfort, healthfulness. And of course, you would like to look not only at how much electricity you spend, you would like to look at the emissions. But that depends on the mix of electricity. Also, you'd like to look at the entire building life cycle. Buildings are recyclable, in a sense. Yes. Uh, sometimes it is being used, because the question is, are all these just constraints under one objective? No, actually, uh, there, there are multiple objectives. There is nothing that, that tells us that today's, for example, building environment is as healthy as it can be. It can actually be improved. Comfort can be improved. There is uh, excellent work has been done for decades in the uh, Center for the Built Environment here, where they look you know, at all these elements in the, with the objective of, of reducing energy, but also improving the experience. So we started with a metaphor. And the metaphor is uh, to view the building as a factory. Of course, not uh, as a physical structure of the factory, but as a conceptual structure of a factory. Our idea is, well, it's not an entirely novel idea, but the metaphor, the central metaphor is that the building produces something, and the factory produces something. Of course, the, the factory produces goods. The building's goods is the indoor environment. And the indoor environment is not a starting thing. It is indeed a product. It is a product that uh, all of us collectively specify how it should look, so look like, and the building produces it. And it uses a supply chain in order to do so. By, uh, we can leverage this metaphor and go back to 200 plus years of industrial, since the Industrial Revolution, of many manufacturing techniques that have been put into play that actually do this manufacturing, this production, make this production efficient. Today, we enjoy lots of goods in our lives that are amazingly complex, presumably amazingly expensive if you simply produce one copy. of. Imagine producing the first copy of the iPhone, how much that would cost. But now we can do it essentially for a few dollars. So, so how does a building work? How does a factory work? Well, we have the supply chain in the building. It's going to be energy and other resources. And there's a product which is going to be the indoor environment uh, to serve this particular marketplace, occupants and processes. And now we can bring to bear different, different metaphors. Uh, when it comes to the design of the product, there are many techniques that people design products. You have to, to, to examine the marketplace, see what it needs, optimize it and do quite a bit of uh, perhaps uh, sometimes theoretical, sometimes practical, uh, sometimes data mining, whatever it takes in order to come up with a good product definition. Then there's going to be the design. The design is submitted 
to the, to, to, to the plant. The plant, you have to design the plant. You have to do some planning in its operation, some scheduling at a shorter time constant, some control sometimes in the millisecond time constant in order to produce that. And of course, when it comes to the manufacturing operation, there is so much technology and so many ideas that come into play. Statistical process control is central in this. It has come into, come into play in the last 100 years. It is being used for detecting anomalies, uh, building on top of that diagnostics, and of course, some more modern techniques like just-in-time, walking process, forecasting, equipment modeling, plant diagnostics, and so on. Okay, metaphors are useful. Uh, they are useful to us in order to describe something, and maybe they bring a sense of novelty, but of course they're dangerous as well. You can, you can only stress them so much. Uh, if you look at the building reality, again following this metaphor, uh, then the building can perhaps be broken into three conceptual, conceptual spaces. Uh, the first space is this, the physical space that we will occupy. This is the front end, this is what you're experiencing. This is the, where the demand for this market, the, the marketplace is its demand. So what we can put into place there to help us uh, design things effectively and quickly, occupant identification, localization, historical tracking, calendar fusion, right? I mean, if, uh, if our calendars all knew that uh, some of us will be attending this presentation right now, maybe there will kind of be some energy scheduling, not only to prepare this room for this, but also to dim down and uh, you know, uh, save energy in our primary offices and so on. Uh, history, of course, can be harnessed into pred predictions and so on and so forth. So that's the front end. There is the back end. This is where, the, this is where the, the building is doing all the dirty work in the background. This is where the, the HVAC and you know, the various systems, but of course techniques like forecasting, planning, and scheduling, supply chain management, everything happens here, the optimization happens here. And then there is a third space. The third space is the cyberspace. Is the, is the uh, logical representation of the building, is the model of the building. Uh, and uh, this model, of course, has to represent what the building does, and that's not an easy task. As you know, when it comes to building model modeling, there is tremendous progress in the last 15 years. Uh, uh, DOE2 and Energy Plus, these are models that are being used quite universally these days. However, these models, everybody will acknowledge, they have fairly many, many limitations. They give you a kind of a textbook, simplified description of the building, and the physical building deviates from those almost from day one. And, uh, but here we're talking about models, again, borrowed from manufacturing applications, that will quickly adapt by merging data from the real operation, and they will keep this model fresh and relevant. And of course, uh, the many, many of these techniques can be uh, operated from that point. And of course, uh, in today's uh, plug and play world, there is yet another look, and, and this is probably my last uh, diagram that I'll show you in this talk, uh, where you can imagine that you have a backbone of information, you have different functions that the building will support, modeling, a group of modeling functions, a group of operating functions, uh, some way to incorporate external inputs, some way to incorporate uh, uh, internal inputs. And this uh, kind of underlines the need to start looking at the logical representation of the building in a much more coherent and structured way. And that gave the rise to, 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 to the term the building operating system that David Kaller has coined some time ago. Uh, so all these things can be really, uh, you know, in a plug and play, plug and play condition. Now, in describing a program like this, once, uh, one, you know, I, I have two ways to go. I can tell you a lot about the organization, how it is structured, or I can give you lots of examples of what it does in order to, to give you a flavor. And I, I would take the latter approach. But first I would like to, to tell you that uh, even though these ideas could have been conceived and in fact have been discussed decades ago, today we can really harness Moore's law to go much further than it could have done some time ago. Why is that? Of course, information technology is central and having plentiful and inexpensive information technology responses, uh, resources at our hands is gonna be very useful. But it is not just information technology. And uh, this is a little bit, uh, Subtle, but information technology is not just informing us. Uh, Moore's law and the advance in information technology did not just give us cheaper computing. What it gave us, it gave us cheaper technology. And the cheaper technology is all the silicon process technology that now has been leveraged and amortized to do other things beyond integrated circuits. MEMS would not exist. 
if we didn't have plentiful uh, technology at low cost to process silicons. Nanotechnology would not have started if Moore's driver here to do chip and microprocessors did not draw so many people to look at these technologies. Ubiquitous electronics, big data mining, these are examples that information technology has driven as secondary effects perhaps, but very beneficial as well. So information technology does not only inform, it also helps us to act. As an example, right? If you look at today's automobile, uh, of course, it's much more complex than they, they are much more complex than they used to be. But if you look at the penetration of men's, and of course, the information technology infrastructure that is needed, now you see that this is not just information. Now you go into actuation there. So we hope to see something similar in the building of the future. We hope to see actuation penetrate the building of the future at that, at that extent. And there is a metaphor, again, that has been uh, developed here by Professor Jan Rabai and others on, uh, around the, the, you know, in the idea that, uh, of course, we now have the cloud in today's, uh, today's computational paradigm. We have the devices through which we interact with the cloud. And we have this outer layer, the so-called swarm of all these devices that interact with the cloud without bothering us humans. They go directly. And these devices tell things about the environment, the actuator in the environment, and so on. Again, uh, this can play many roles in many areas, but when it comes to building sustainability, I think it's going to be central. OK. So now let's go to the program. Uh, the program itself, uh, so what do you do if you're given quite a bit of resources and you want to address buildings, right? The first, the first thing you realize is that it's a very amorphous problem. And it's a very interdisciplinary problem, just to, 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 to use the, the positive spin to this. So the way we structured, we structured it, uh, we, we decided that, of course, information technology is going to be important. So a thrust went into that. Uh, control is going to be important at various levels. Uh, so a thrust when did it, when did it get to control. Uh, the fact that you have to plug and play things, uh, it's going to be critical. So the high confidence building operating system is, is, is allocated to thrust. And then, of course, you, you realize two things that many programs kind of miss, OK? Buildings, much as we would like to describe it as machines, they include people. And people have to be uh, comprehended and uh, be part of the equation. In fact, uh, I was uh, seeing some data on uh, how much variation you see in building energy consumption among structures that are identical in the same climate, OK? Um, if you look at an apartment building in Beijing, you know, identical apartments side by side, what range would you see? 10%, 20%? Hmm? It's 4 to 1, right? 4 to 1. And, uh, and the interesting thing that, that we heard, that when it comes to uh, the American uh, residential model, which is a single family home, over the years, insulation has improved, windows have improved. So they took the climate out of the building. So most of it that matters now is human behavior, right? Because the building is now fairly well insulated. Than you so how much range would you see there? 20 to 1, right? People run, leave the AC running all, you know, you know it, it's done in stupid ways, but the range is amazing. So, so, and you cannot just remove it with automation. You have to comprehend human behavior, and you have to incorporate it and perhaps find ways to, to, to modify it. OK. Final thing is that, uh, of course, buildings will be recycled. It will either be done well or it's going to be done badly, right? The materials are going to go into the landfill are going to be reused. So the material and the design and the life cycle of the building is quite important uh, when it comes to sustainability. And there is another overarching thrust in, in us on doing all our experiments together in a test bedding scenario. So let me give you just now some examples. From now on, I'm just going to uh, you know, sprinkle some examples. Uh, a thrust one example in information technology is power disaggregation. Of course, you can do sensors. Of course, you can measure power. But if we measure power in this room, I, I, it is spent in so many ways. There are all these slides. There are plug-in devices and so on. Which one is what, right? Of course, you can conceive a world that you can have a dedicated sensor for each device, and this might happen in the future, but this is not the reality today. So today, you have the reality that you see is a composite signal, and this composite signal uh, 
has contributors from many devices that can be on and off in an overlapping ways. In this case, we had, we had uh, a laptop, we have a desktop, and we have a screen. This is actually data. And the interesting thing is that, uh, I apologize for the, for the wrong sequence here, if you me measure them separately, this is to, to get some ground truth, this is how the desktop looks like. It has a fairly square pattern. It's either on, off, or on, and it has a fixed power. Uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, the, the monitor, the computer monitor. This is the desktop. It has a flat power, but because there is some activity, there is has, has more noise. And this is your laptop. Your laptop has an exponential component. Why? Because it charges batteries, and when the batteries are being charged, it drops down. So if you hypothesize, if you build a library of these profiles somehow, then you can look at the composite signal, use, use some advanced real-time statistics, and break down the signal here. In this case, it told us when the screen is on, when the desktop is on, and when the, when the, the laptop is on. It's not perfect. There's quite a bit of noise. But you can do disaggregation and create these virtual sensors for zero money, really, to, to give you more information. That's one example. Uh, another example, of course, you can always use, use more information. Creating inexpensive platforms to collect it is always interesting, and it's always chasing the technology around. Uh, now we have a plethora of, of inexpensive radios, either Wi-Fi or Zigbee's or whatever, that, that can be incorporated. In this case, it's a discrete radio, but in many times, just need maybe one square millimeter of silicon to drop in a Zigbee design in there that, is, that costs next to nothing, pennies. But the interesting thing is that you have more and more transducers that are quite inexpensive. Uh, one of the latest finds is that now you can buy a particulate monitor, a monitor that, that, that counts particles of dust within a certain range of microns in diameter. And this used to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is now seven or eight dollars that can do that. And this particular monitor tells you a lot about how healthy the environment is. But as I will show you later, it's also a measure of activity. As we walk around, we create a cloud behind us, right? So this can be a measure of activity. And of course, of others. The, the missing link here today is a, a relatively inexpensive, very reliable carbon dioxide monitor. These are very useful occupant detectors uh, or, or thermal load, if you say detectors in a room, because of all the CO2 that we exhale. But these are expensive. These are hundreds of dollars. And uh, we, are, we are working with people to try to bring the cost of those down. And then, of course, the platforms to plug them together. Uh, this is a cute example that we had uh, the privilege of demonstrating to the, to the prime minister of Singapore once. Uh, this is one of our students, Kevin Weekly. What he's doing, he's, he's showing how all these things can go together. He's holding an Android, pa an Android pad. The pad is just going through real-time video of what is behind it. And perhaps you can see these QR codes that are kind of clumsy, clumsily taped on these devices. These devices are identified in the video by the QR codes, but the devices are metered through some wireless meters, power meters. And this is happening in Singapore right now. This meters is feeding the information to our servers here. Our servers here are doing the analysis and allows the, this pad to, in real time to replace the image of the QR code with the tag that's showing the real time energy conservation and it shows, uh, and if you click on that, you can see some historical information as well. So this can be perhaps an application can be ported to, 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 to a device meant for enhanced reality, that, like the Google Glass, if we get our hands on one of those, probably port it into that. Uh, you can say a lot about control. The interesting part here is that, uh, of course, we start with the mathematical models with the thermal behavior of the building. But the interesting part is that, uh, the building itself is, is instrumented. These models are being informed by, by the instrumentation in real time. So these models conform to the building. And then you can use them to do some, some, some interesting control. In this example, we play with the comfort band, uh, depending on whether the, the, the room is occupied or not. And of course, uh, it becomes more expensive to maintain it here, less expensive to do that here, by, but by implementing a protocol like this. Just by playing with controls, not by adding any hardware, really, you can, you can have significant energy savings uh, in, in, uh, in air conditioning in this case. Speaking of air conditioning, uh, one of the interesting things in working in Singapore with this is, of course, prevalent, maybe, I don't know, I don't know more than 50% of the energy in buildings is spent in air conditioning. 
there is not much heating involved in HVAC. It's mostly, it's mostly cooling. But air conditioning itself, I found out, well, those of you who know are not surprised, it involves quite a bit of heating because they have to dehumidify the air, and sometimes it's done by preheating the air, and dehumidifying other times is done by using dry or, 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 or liquid desiccants. Uh, this is a technology that, that has been introduced recently of having of active, active chill beams. That means that uh, in the hood, in the room, you have the heat exchanger right there, which means that you don't have to send cold air over long distances, so that you don't have to cool the air too low, and which means that uh, by having the heat exchange close to the, to the service points, the cold water that you have to chill doesn't need to be chilled too low either. There's quite a bit of savings based on that. Uh, we are fortunate to be associated with uh, some fairly significant experimental infrastructure in Singapore that is playing with innovative techniques in air conditioning, and uh, that is going to be play quite a bit of a role. Uh, an idea that was introduced was coined here many years ago in local, the idea of having uh, an intelligent power switch that presumably is going to have some storage at the disposal. We're putting this at work by bringing some of the best people in power, engine, power electronics in this case, they are doing a fairly sophisticated management scheme for managing these very expensive lithium-ion batteries that might play this role to extend the life cycle. Uh, but the most interesting part is that now we're introducing uh, non-chemical storage. We're introducing, uh, we're introducing a spinning mass okay, to, 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 to store the devices. And we have actually a couple of these devices, one of them it's about, you know, like a beer keg that can store a kilowatt hour or so. And the interesting part of this is that uh, of these devices, unlike batteries, that can be charged and discharged, quote unquote, very quickly, can be accelerated and decelerated very quickly to give out energy. And we also have a commercial unit. It's the size of a big refrigerator. And if you open it, it has a vacuum pumps, pumps and uh, the whole spinning mass is in vacuum. And the whole spinning mass is not touching anything because it has magnetic bearings. And uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, one of the concepts that we are actually putting into play is, of course, the DC reality behind this intelligent power switch, where you can have this AC grid that you have to, to, that you have to, integ to integrate to. But what you have behind it, which is storage, which is renewables, which is consumption, and so on, it is essentially DC, eliminating the need for many power inefficient inverters in the background. So now we're playing with this, with this in our labs in, in some kind of scale. Just a sprinkling of, uh, of uh, uh, examples from uh, Thrust 4, which, uh, which is caring for, caring for the, in the quality of the indoor environment. We'll have, one, we'll have, we'll have the world-class you know, personalities on that. It's Bill Nazarov from Civil Engineering that has been doing this for, for decades. Uh, and there, and many others actually. And there, the idea is, of course, we don't realize that uh, our buildings can trap quite a bit of quite a bit of chemicals in the air, aerosols, and so on, and this, you know, dust particles and other things that, that can can make people sick. So people are, people are doing some classic techniques. For, for example, uh, you would like to you would like to filter the air as it comes in. Now, that's fine. However, you would like to do it in a way that you don't get heat in the building that you will have, to, that you have to, to, to remove again at the expense of energy. We have to make sure that pollutants stay out of the building. We have to say that to make sure that particulars stay out of the building. And uh, in this facade now, what we try to do, we try to play with some ideas. Uh, you can see here some of the ideas that we're playing by playing with these inexpensive particle monitors. And uh, quite a bit of... Uh, analytics has to go into work. Some of the monitors that we have are actually membranes collecting information that has to be chemically processed in order to see what's going on. Uh, but uh, uh, as I will show you later, there is some collaboration between these and the materials. Now we can see the possibility of having some coatings inside the buildings and some coatings outside the buildings. The coatings do not make the wall look the color you want to make it look, but also it catalyzes and removes some of the, some of, some of the um, harmful, harmful contaminants from the building by trapping, trapping them to the walls. And in the case of the outside world, it's photocatalytic, so it's, a, it's an endless cycle doing this well. Uh, another example would be that in Singapore, because there's so much humidity, you know, 80, 90% most of the time it rains a lot, uh, if you paint a building white, it's not gonna stay white for long. You know, things grow on it very quickly. 
but now you have uh, titanium dioxide coatings that will keep it, keep it actually white, essentially by, by keeping it self-cleaning. This is an interesting, an interesting experiment. I'm showing it here. I'll explain what it's all about because it's a cross-pollination. When you put a project together with thrust, you're always curious to see what's happened when thrust will start collaborating. T1 is the information technology thrust. T4 is the indoor quality thrust. The T4 people, the indoor quality thrust, uh, got us tuned to the idea that you can buy, now buy these very inexpensive particulate monitors. And of course, we are always looking, the T1 people are looking for inexpensive sensors to see what is happening inside the building. This is an example where uh, we're using now these uh, particulate monitors as activity monitors. Now, how do you do activity? Activity, you'd like to see how much movement is in the building, how many people are in the building. You can do it by monitoring CO2, that's expensive. You can do it by having some video processing, that's expensive. In this case, what we have done, we had a camera as ground truth, and this is the camera information. It shows the events of how many people interrupted as they go by with some minimal processing. Uh, these are the events. The green lines are the events. The, the purple line is the cumulative over a period of time. You can see there is more activity here. And this is the particulate monitor. Very decent correlation. Very different, decent correlation of other low cost. So this is an example of how we can start to see this cross-pollination between, between thrust that is so exciting. And we have several others now that are coming around. That's another, that's another interesting one. Here, uh, uh, Professor Khalid Mosalam from, from, chemical, from uh, civil engineering, civil environmental engineering, he's an earthquake expert. He got interested in this building. Uh, he, he's leading the materials, the materials and the design thrust of, the, of there. And they came up with this idea of having this translucent concrete. What is translucent concrete? Well, uh, you would like to harness daylight, uh, right? And there's no point in burning, uh, you know, precious kilowatt hours when there is plenty of light outside, only if you bring the light inside. Well, the traditional way of doing it is by putting windows. Windows are great, but they are, A, expensive. B, they are usually a structural liability, so you have to put beams around them and so on to reinforce what you the, the wall that you're taking away from the windows. And they also see, they're also a thermal reliability. They are not as insulating, usually, unless they are very high end as a wall. So in this case, we are building concrete blocks, and these concrete blocks are, are, are embedded with optical fibers. So light will go through, so you have this piece of the wall that is gonna be uh, luminous, right? So they're actually building these things. They have done quite a bit of studies. Uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, they're getting very sophisticated. The idea here, if I, if I go back, these fibers, of course, replace some of the concrete and, of, and ultimately will replace some of its strength, and you don't want to do that, and they might become also a thermal liability as well. So you'd like these fibers to be far and few in between and very thin. You'd like lots of light to go through. So you will engineer the receptor at the end that is looking at the sun, to collect as much light as possible, and you would like this to be insensitive to rotation because obviously the wall is gonna be what it is. And so they're designing what is known as the Winston cones. These are reflective surfaces that actually uh, have been shown to be very effective in collecting light very efficiently, like a funnel kind of squeezing it through the, through, through the fiber. Of course, uh, People will say, will this thing stay clean? Will it be, will it be you know, maintainable? Maybe, maybe not. It's a very interesting idea, maybe in combination with the materials that will keep this thing clean chemically, maybe that will be practical. But these people are going ahead. These are some, exp we've done both simulation experiments. These are, these are experiments on the, on the helio. Let's call it, uh, I don't know what a heliodon. A heliodon is, is what uh, this uh, instrument is called. PGE owns one. It can be programmed to be illuminated by a simulated sun and uh, replicate conditions at any geographical location on Earth. You know, by, by rotating, of course, you can do that through, sim through simulation as well. And then they can envision a facade of the building where it has real windows and it has these translucent concretes, and this can be combined in a way. So these are real windows, and these are the translucent concrete, and this is real concrete. That, uh, that will give you an, idea, an opportunity to optimize harnessing daylight, structural, uh, structural quality of the building, and of course cost. So here, this is an example I think that uh, is likely to increase the satisfaction of the occupants. 
uh, while reducing energy. High performance green concrete. Now, I learned a lot, and, and I haven't absorbed much. I heard a lot. I have not absorbed much about that issue. Concrete, apparently, as many of you know better than I do, uh, is a very energy uh, hungry process. And in fact, it's a very uh, green, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions intensive process. By, it's, by the way it is done, concrete has some properties that we like. It, you know, it's structurally, you know, it's called concrete for a reason. It has good mechanical properties. So people are playing, are playing with ideas to, to have a different chemistry, to sort of reduce, the, reduce the, the greenhouse emissions from its production. But when you do that, some of its mechanical properties might be compromised. That's not desirable, obviously. Of course, uh, people who build buildings will tell you that you don't need the same quality concrete everywhere. There are some structural components and some components that, that you, you can make some compromises. But here they say, okay, let's, let's talk about this high performance green concrete by essentially embedding fibers into it. This is a fiber for strength now, not fibers for, for making translucent. And people are going ahead and doing quite a bit of experiments in that. This is an example where shows that uh, how much uh, force it's going to take before it breaks. And in this case, instead of breaking, you have a more you know, uh, acceptable deformation by having uh, embedded fibers. Uh, this experiment, many of these experiments are happening here in, uh, in, in uh, the machines that we have at the Richmond Field Station where uh, you can put thousands of pounds and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and test uh, different components. For that. These machines were used traditionally for earthquake analysis to, to, to look at the strength of joints, but now uh, they are putting this sustainability element into this by testing materials that are engineered to be sustainable and to see how much compromise you get and how you can mitigate that compromise in, in their physical strength. Uh, these are some other ideas. Uh, this is uh, now you can imagine this uh, multifunctional concrete blocks that, uh, that are lighter that they have uh, embedded bubbles in order to increase the thermal insulation. And at the same time, of course, you can imagine high-tech coatings, both the interior and the uh, exterior coatings, that have the, the outside coating might maintain the appearance of the building and might act as a cool roof kind of, uh, kind of uh, material. And the indoor can, can have a beneficial cycle in cleaning the air inside the building. Uh, actually, this work is quite advanced. Uh, the, our friends in the National University of Singapore have been at work for a while on this thing. This shows that uh, the removal of uh, this nasty chemical here, sulfur dioxide, I think it is, and uh, based on what, over time, based on the coating that you have on the wall. And uh, you can see here that uh, titanium dioxide uh, is proving to be quite quite effective in cleaning the air of things of things like that. By the way, you might wonder where all these things are happen where, where where all these things are coming from. I'm learning I'm learning that cooking has a lot to do with it. When you burn natural gas and when you you mix different things, there, there's lots of small quantities but actually quite harmful chemicals that are released in the air. And I also learned that uh, vending the cooking sometimes is not very well understood. And uh, so it's not done very well. Um, finally, recycling. I, we have tons and tons of, literally tons and tons of work on that. But, uh, but primarily the idea here is that Singapore is worried about this. They think it's a very small place. They don't have no landfill, really. And of course, they would like to be, to be able to reuse. All of us can benefit from the, by serving that need. Concrete is either crushed or burned. And uh, they are looking at techniques where where the, the resulting of these operations can be actually be a beneficial component ingredient in order to recycle it and, and build it again. And uh, that's very promising. Finally, let's, let's say a little bit about the test bed. Our test bed, there are many test beds around. And uh, we have seen test beds in Tsinghua, Tsinghua where they actually built a building. And the building, you can plug different windows and so on. There is an excellent example of a physical test bed happening up on LBNL, the Flex Lab, they call it, where they have uh, three facilities, one of them fully rotational in order to simulate different, different orientations. Uh, big facilities, 30 by 30 feet, that you can do, that you can put lighting, air conditioning components, plug and play, many millions of dollars spent on that. Uh, our test bed is distributed in a way. 
We do quite a bit on information technology. This is the example of what we're doing in 406 Corey Hall, where that uh, is one of our local physical centers. We have you know, a large group of meters. Uh, we realize that the future is going to be uh, a bit of amorphous. So I don't think it's going to be a common standard in these things. So we have to be able to accommodate many things. We are using SMAP extensively to do the translation, but not, but not uh, exclusively. We have uh, very inexpensive meters using Zigbee. We're using the ACME meters that were developed by Professor Callan and his group. We're using commercial power meters. Of course, we use, uh, we use uh, uh, scanners. We use, this is actually, this is not uh, properly labeled. This is, we use a dent, uh, dent meters on the panels and, and so on and so forth, including building automation that is available commercially right now, but we are hacking it. Essentially, we are putting all in a network so we can control our sun blinds automatically. We have western facing windows that, that can use that. We have occupancy sensors and we try to build, a, to build a, a mobile apps to control that. We have, a, uh, we have uh, similar test beds in collaborative side at Tsinghua in the new Tripoli building in Beijing. They have half a floor that they're doing something very similar. Of course, our 11th floor looks like that, more or less. And, uh, we try to, to promote this idea that test beds would be kind of open sourceable so that people can access them and do experiments remotely. And, uh, and we play with various ideas on how to structure that. This is uh, the, the paradigm that we, that we use, for, for example, when it comes to integrating sensor data. We've all seen SMAP and how useful it has been in taking time series and putting them up. Now, of course, there is, there is uh, lots of metadata that needs to be included in order to make that actionable and to aggregate it and working on this level as well. And that's, that's actually an, another view of that. We call it the sensing bubble. Okay, so in summary, I think probably it's a good time to conclude. Uh, we started with this metaphor, and those of you who are, who are astute enough, you will see that when I told you about the many examples, this metaphor doesn't really come through. And it hasn't come through yet uh, very extensively. It has come through in this thrust one. We do lots of information processing. We borrow lots of ideas from, from, uh, from, uh, from design, from factories here. We borrow some of the ideas in control, but then we have to comprehend many other things in order to go and put this metaphor fully at work. Our program is comprehensive all the way from simulation to actually materials to I didn't tell you much about human behavior or human modeling. That belongs in Thrust One. Uh, and we have several papers that are going out, but maybe next presentation can give you some information about that and how that works. Uh, lots of credits. So that's a cast of thousands here. Uh, these are the people from uh, Berkeley involved into that. People who are racking up the frequent flyer miles to go to Singapore. <laughs> Uh, the excellent people from NTU and NUS and collaborators, both here in Singapore. And of course, uh, I would like to stress that this indeed is a partnership with many institutions. And uh, again, uh, uh, this is how our campus looks like. So any of you who happen to be in the neighborhood, I would love to give you the tour. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, I was recently in, in Singapore, and I just, I love the place, so. Um, but I was at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, SUDI. Is there any future with them yeah. working? Because my talk was on smart people products and buildings on the smart grid, and they were really excited about that topic. Uh, that's, that's, you know, uh, SUTD, right? Singapore yeah. University of Technology and Design was started by MIT. Yeah. MIT was commissioned to start a new university. MIT was part of this creative program. They were actually the founding partner of this program. And now the, the, the original director, which is Tom Magnati, is now the, yeah. the founding president of this university. It's very exciting. Uh, this university has just started. They had the first cohort, I think, this fall. And uh, uh, they're already talking to us. So talking to Tom quite extensively. Uh, one of the pillars, they have four different pillars, is architecture or design, they call it, but it's mostly architecture. Yeah. So I would like, really like to work with them. Yeah, the, yeah, and I've been working with the design group. Yeah. Um, and so I'd love to yeah. follow up on it. Yeah. Okay. 
so for this building, so for the PV generation, how large is the PV generation compared with the total building load? Since it usually takes a lot of area too. <laughs> it does. Uh, what do you see? Uh, uh, the, you see the PVs here. Yes. And of course, this building, the high rise, has PVs on top. What you don't see, because it's it's on the other side, uh, because the sun is in Singapore is very reliable. Uh -huh. It's always on one side, right? right. Uh, they have essentially the whole vertical side of the building is covered with the semi-transparent PVs. Now, how big it is? Uh, not big because Singapore is, is not, doesn't have much direct sunlight. It doesn't look like this very frequently. It's usually, it's usually cloudy. Um, I would guess that, that the PVs on that building may be covered 20% okay, I see. of its fish power, which is not bad. Yeah, we, we recently have some simulation to say if we have the PV penetration, since PV is not reliable, it's changing over time. Mm -hmm. it, if the PV integration is too large, it will have a bad impact on the voltage or the frequency of the connection right. between the utility. To observe that, I think 20% is roughly the threshold to see that. It is the threshold to seeing that. Uh, well, uh, many of these, uh, I, I'm glad you brought this. this uh, the issue of renewable penetration into the grid has the potential of destabilizing the grid. And people say even at the large scale, at the California scale, when you get to 20 to 25% of wind and, and, and solar, then the variability of that has to be, it cannot be left unchecked. You have to compensate for it. So you have to bring into play fast uh, rapid firing diesel plants that are actually quite dirty. And people will show you in simulations that beyond a certain point, you lose the carbon benefit by needing all these other plants. So that's why people play with these ideas of storage. For example, uh, using, using the, uh, using the uh, spinning mass storage, right? It's, uh, that's a way to quickly absorb rapid variability. Uh, this building has that built in. We have some of that built in by design. And many new buildings, many new solar farms, you have underground all these big refrigerators spinning storage in order to, in order to, to, to uh, compensate for it. So when you said the fuel, you meant for Singapore, because in, in California, we'd probably use natural gas that's cleaner and more. Um, yeah. um, also, there's, there's technologies being evolved in how to absorb more and more um, renewable energies. Uh, and if you can kind of, I guess, master the, the power grid and seeing where everything is, you could manage it to a, a lot higher extent and be able to bring that up past 25%. Uh, indeed, uh, the tech, and, and that actually, it, that, that can be addressed at the scale of a building or at the scale of a, na scale of a nation. What you're probably referring to is the fact that people have been counting for the loads to be oblivious, but now the, loads, the load itself cannot be oblivious. There is demand response that, uh, that uh, the load has to be informed, and actually some of the adjustment is not done on the production side, it is done on the consumption side. Inside a building, and there's quite a bit of work on how to distribute the pain. If there is a demand from the utility to reduce, con to reduce uh, consumption, then you have many choices on how to accommodate this demand within the building. So many of these techniques are actually are geared to give you the knowledge to see what load is deferrable, what load actually can be used as storage. Um, thermal storage has been used in buildings many times. The, 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 the natural thermal storage has been used quite a bit. So yes, there are solutions. In practice, uh, if you look at this happening, the great demand response has very small penetration so far. One thing I noticed on your charts, you had 12% for the heating water, I think, and um, a lot of other percentage, like 20% or something for the heating and cooling for, I guess, overall. Yeah. But a lot of that, especially in Singapore, could be done with solar. Yeah, that, that was, that was uh, U.S. data that I had, yeah. In Singapore, it's different. It's a different mix. Thanks very much for the talk. The, the, it's exciting to see so much, uh, so much work happening in so many areas. I wanted to comment, though, on the, me the factory metaphor. Mm -hmm. In the particular way you phrased it, the, uh, the product is indoor environment. That seems to assume that um, people, no matter who they are, what they're doing, or what activity is, want the same indoor environment. Um, and I think that's questionable, that different kinds of activities 
uh, will call for different, different degrees of variability, different degree tolerance for different conditions and so forth. And it may be more productive uh, to, th to think about the building as a factory producing whatever that building is producing, whatever goods are, yeah. um, uh, are happening, and that the question of how to uh, think about the human interactions inside the building would be illuminated by relating what the people are trying to do in their work with what the building is doing. Indeed, uh, I think, uh, you know, you, you, you said that uh, the, that metaphor might imply that everybody in the building processes and people, regardless of what they're doing and when, should be satisfied with one. Uh, and I was trying to use this metaphor to, to stress the opposite. Factories nowadays can, can do fairly, you know, very wide range of customizable products. So they call it the mass customization that is actually the cost of that is dropping, and I was hoping that buildings could go into that. Of course, you need, the building needs to know what to produce and where to produce it. It has to have the capability to give you a microenvironment. Most buildings don't. Future buildings might. But no, I, I think this metaphor should be used to, to really indicate the opposite, and so I agree with you. Yes. Very good. Okay, thanks once again for a fantastic talk. Thank you.